Simon, gerne du på den anfange? På den kast? Du må anfange. Har du bare været? Okay, schönen Nachmittag. Uh, good afternoon, as this is the keynote session. Um, and the two speakers have not managed to learn German that quickly. Uh, we will have the session in English. We have two very distinguished speakers this afternoon. Um, we have Ingvild Tjelmeland from Norway. Um, I, in preparation uh, of this session, I tried to look and find out about our two speakers. Ingvild, uh, I learned from her Norwegian LinkedIn page, uh, which is hard, quite hard to understand for me, but I learned that she's, a, she's been an ICU nurse for approximately 10 years, and uh, she had gained a master's degree, and now she's the program director of the Norwegian CPR, or Cardiac Arrest Registry, and she's played a major role uh, in setting up the Eureka study, which we have heard about this morning. Our second speaker uh, will be Ian um, from Southampton. Southampton is where the Titanic left for her first and final cruise. Um, he's an emergency physician, consultant of emergency physician, uh, of emergency medicine, and he will, he has, he has uh, apparently authored a very important book which uh, helps junior emergency physicians prepare for their final exam, uh, and he's uh, very active in medical education in the online and social media, and we we'll are be happy to hear about his talk also. So I'd like to ask uh, Ingrid first, and I will clear the stage. Good afternoon. And uh, may I ask you for the... Thank you. My name is Ingvild Helmland, and uh, I'm the leader of the Norwegian Cardiac Arrest Registry. Uh, I'm educated as an ICU nurse, like he said, and I worked for a few years, or quite a few years. Uh, and during my master's, I got the opportunity to work daytime, which is not usual as an ICU nurse. And then I started working with the registry. Um, my master's is in evidence-based practice. If you translate that to normal English, it means how to use research in everyday life. Um, and I work with the registry since 2010. Uh, I will share with you the work and the experiences that I have with the Norwegian registry for the last six years. But it's no quick fix lecture. This will not fix it for you in your country when you're doing your uh, building your registry. Uh, however, Norway is the only country in Europe, or basically in the world, that has uh, cardiac arrest as a reportable disease. This means it's mandatory by law to report cardiac arrests to the registry. Uh, I'm employed in the capital in Norway, uh, at the biggest hospital, which has about 20,000 employees. I'm part of uh, NACOS, the Norwegian Advisory Unit on Pre-Hospital Care. We care about everything that has to do with emergency and blue lights. We were established in, the Norwegian Registry was established in 2003 as part of an NGO, a voluntary organization. Um, but we were included in the University Hospital in uh, 2000 and, oh, I've written nine here, but it's 2004. Um, and uh, the NACOS also does a lot of other things. We are involved in research. We, have, uh, we follow scientific developments. We help implement new, new research and education. We have our own web page where everybody or all the EMS services can set up their own sort of room 
Uh, and here they document their education and their um, um, and when they are due for renewal, which means that your boss can see when you are due for doing your courses all over again, like a CPR, CPR course. Um, we use the web page together with colleagues around the country to improve the level of care for our patients. We also consult uh, units, when, uh, EMS units, when we have questions and when we have, uh, and we have a dialogue with the Norwegian authorities. And we're the link, sort of, between the Norwegian authorities and the EMS personnel that are out there doing the job. We're also involved in disaster preparedness, and uh, one of our biggest jobs was doing the evaluation after the shooting and the bomb in Oslo and on the Utøya, where 77 young uh, people were killed. I sort of skipped my manuscript there, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the employees in NACOS, in my unit, are advised to do clinical work together with their theoretical work so that we don't forget what it's like out there. Doing only research or only paperwork, you sort of lose touch with reality. Now, um, that was my background. That's what I do. That's where I come from. Uh, but today, I wish to share with you the work that I've done, or that we have done with the re uh, registry. But I will do a short introduction of what cardiac arrest is. I I think you all know what cardiac arrest is, but I'd like to just tell you how we defined it in the registry. Um, I'll also give you a short introduction to Norway as a country. Uh, it's far up there somewhere, so I'll, I'll just tell you very shortly how it, uh, where it is and how it works. Uh, and we will look into the treatment of cardiac arrest and how it has affected, uh, the history of cardiac arrest has affected the work that we do in Norway. I'll take you through what I've done the last six years and our results from the interventions. Uh, I've done a lot of interventions and uh, we have some results. I'll also show you the results from last year's report, the yearly report. Okay, cardiac arrest, this is the easy part. It's when the heart stops and no blood flows to vital organs. People die if nothing is done. Um, the heart stopping could be that it's in ventricular fibrillation or a systole or PEA. Uh, either way, people are, if no intervention is done, clinically dead. The patient is not responding. Um, it's very difficult to see that the heart has stopped. So what we do is we use uh, what we see to define cardiac arrest. That is, the patient is not responding to stimulation and not breathing normally. And lay people or EMS personnel says that the patient needs CPR. This is the inclusion criteria. This is our definition of cardiac arrest. So Norway, it's up there. It's a long country. It has only 5.2 million inhabitants, which is uh, a little less than half of what you have in Austria. S total square uh, kilometers is 385,000. Doesn't tell you a lot, but it's four and a half times bigger than Austria. This means we have a fairly large country with fairly few people. Our coastline is so long that if you stretch it out, it goes two and a half times around the equator. It's coastline. It's what we have. <laughs> so uh, history is almost my, five, my favorite part. Uh, it's when people fall asleep, and I'll try to keep you awake. Uh, in 1774, the Royal Human Society was formed. Their major interest was medical technical resuscitation. What we do today is not really new. This quote here is by W. Henley in 1774, suggesting the use of electric shock to the brain and the heart when a patient is dead from drowning, etc. This means the treatment we use today was already suggested back in 1774. 
1779, a young girl was resuscitated after a trauma with the use of an electric shock. 1818, uh, Frankenstein's monster was revived using electricity. It was written as a horror story. But already back then, they thought that electricity could be used to give life. A lot happened in the 19th century, but we jumped to 1930, when the first hospital resuscitation team was promoted. In 1947, open chest defibrillation was uh, used successfully, and the patient survived. First time. Uh, and in 1955, the first recorded rhythm of uh, closed chest uh, defibrillation was documented. In September 1960, Resusi Anne was born. Uh, and in 1961, the teaching of CPR with rescue breaths and compressions was advocated. The first guidelines were published in 1966. It took some more time before electric shock was introduced as a standard method, but the first portable defibrillator was made in 1979. I know for sure that some of you were not even born when this was done. Still, we struggled to get the defibrillator out to the patient. Well, registries in Norway. In 1951, we, have a, had, we got a cancer registry, which meant that cancer was made a reportable disease. Everybody, all the doctors, anybody had to report cancer. Um, in 2010, we got the cardiovascular disease registry, and all cardiovascular diseases were made reportable. In 2014, we had 52 different registries, which means a lot of extra paperwork for people in hospital. But there's just one pre-hospital registry in Norway, and that's cardiac arrest. The birth of Resusi Ann is very important to us in Norway. She's Norwegian, basically. Um, the face has been discussed a lot of times. It's not any of the Lardal family, but uh, she still, she was born in Stavanger, which is only 10 kilometers from my hometown. So, um, and, and she has had impact on the entire Norwegian nation. A lot of research has been done in Norway also. Uh, in connection to Stavanger and Oslo, you probably heard about some of the publications. This here is a publication back in 1976. So we've been doing this for a while. Uh, several articles have been published the last 10 years as well, claiming that Norway is the best country in the world if you're going to have a cardiac arrest. We only have publications from areas in Norway. So Norway, we don't know if Norway is the best country in the world to have a cardiac arrest. The first national publication came in 2014. Utstein reporting is probably known to most of you. This is Utstein. It's an abbey outside of Stavanger, and the first meeting was held there in 1991. Uh, we took the world leaders in cardio, uh, cardiac arrest and resuscitation science. We transported them to the abbey, at that time, there was no internet and no mobile uh, coverage. And we left them there and said, you can come back out when you agree on what to report on cardiac arrest. It took less than a week. Very effective. After 1991, there has been 25 Utstein Abbey meetings. That's quite a lot. And quite a few of them have been on, oh, quite a lot of them have been on um, consensus on reporting which means we agree on what to report. So the Norwegian Cardiac Arrest Registry was um, established as a pre-hospital register in 2002. This is 19 years after the Utstein meeting. So we're, we don't give up easily, but we are a little slow. Um, we could include all patients that died but we needed consent from survivors. 
In uh, 2009, we were closed down because we couldn't really prove that we had consent from all our patients. And then the Norwegian law changed, which meant we were actually breaking the law by having the registry. Um, so, and 19 years after the Utstein meeting, we got the um, reportable disease, the cardiovascular disease registry, uh, nationally approved. Uh, and which meant that we could actually apply to join this registry. The cardiac arrest registry could apply to join this big registry. Um, and joining this big, big registry, we didn't need consent from the patients anymore. With the new uh, big registry in the Norwegian cardiac arrest, we considered... Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, with this new registry, the cardiac arrest registry from 2002 was considered for resuscitation. It was just difficult to read this in my papers. <laughs> um, and uh, we tried to resuscitate it, and uh, we decided to give up, and it was declared dead in 2011. With these changes, we could start all over again. And then we made a new steering committee with representatives from all major regions in Norway. The Norwegian Resuscitation Council has a member. There is a member from the Myocardial Infarction Registry and one member from the Norwegian Society of Cardiologists. There is a patient representative and there is a person working in a local registry there. Inclusion and exclusion criteria were described again extensively so that they could not be, or we thought they could not be understood, misunderstood. Uh, and we translated the Utstein definitions again to make sure that we were clear and in cooperation with the new Utstein reporting. We include all patients suffering from cardiac arrest out of hospital in Norway, where any form of, patient, of treatment is started by lay people or EMS. We chose to start with the pre-hospital part because there was one employee and uh, we needed to start somewhere we thought we could manage. We are now including uh, patients suffering cardiac arrest inside hospitals as well. And this is inclusion criteria is the same as out of hospital. Any form of treatment started by lay people or medical personnel should be included. We also include children and race or beliefs or anything else has no impact on inclusion. This is what it looked like the first year after I started resuscitation, uh, started the registry, 2011. Reporting areas covered 11% of the population. Now what? We thought we had a registry, we thought we could start. 11% um, is not very impressive the first year, but it's a good start. Um, and we could interpret the results of 11% in two ways. Either we could say, oh darn, this is not really good, is it? Or we could say, hey, this is a challenge. I can do this. We started building a network. I chose to do the last part. Being depressed is not really my thing, so I thought, hey, I can do better than that. We started building networks, different kinds of networks. For the in-hospital people doing CPR in teaching in the hospital, but also for ambulance personnel teaching CPR out of hospital. Uh, we did site visits, which meant that we kept visiting sites or hospitals or areas where they wanted to start registration. We did dialogue with politicians. That's always a long uh, monologue or dialogue, depending on who you meet, but it's important to keep up the relations. We did a dialogue with the Ministry of Health. We made a user manual for establishing local registries. Because we believe that if people locally own their data, if they feel that this is our data, the data is better and more reliable than if they just plot it in to send it to me. Um, also in the user manual, I uh, try to read 
the Norwegian law, which meant that I used quite some time to study all the laws in Norway. Then I translated it into ordinary people words and put it in a short version in this user manual. So if, if somebody needs to understand why and how and which paragraph we're referring to, they can look it up in the manual and do it quite easily. We made contact with other national registries to try to learn from what they were doing. Uh, try not to make their mistakes and just pick the nice things that they were doing and put that in our registry. And we sent Christmas cards to everybody. It's quite important. You're laughing and I'm laughing. But this had a big impact. Well, fairly big impact. Reporting areas now covered 34% of the population. A bit depressing, but also quite good. We still, you probably wouldn't know from this map, but we still didn't have data from Stavanger and Tromsø, which made some major publications during this period but they didn't send the data to the National Registry. So what did we do on top of that? We kept sending letters. Uh, we kept visiting hospitals. We kept sending Christmas cards when we kept building networks. This is an ongoing process. On top of that, we got an approval as a National Medical Registry, which was a dialogue with the health authorities in Norway. Uh, that meant we could be included in the National Cardiovascular Disease Registry. By being included there, we didn't need consent, but if somebody applied for data, we would have to give it to them, even if we didn't like them. But that's part of the down part. If somebody had a good protocol, I'd have to send them data. Um, then we sent letters to all hospital administrators. Nice letters saying, hey, would you like to join? We can come visit. Um, and uh, we developed an e-learning or an online learning where everybody, all ambulance personnel, could go in and learn why they should register cardiac arrest. And I was allowed or invited to join the Eureka team. Not an impressive impact. 2013, we covered 43% of the population. We're still below 50% of Norway. Um, and during the site visits, I actually um, spent a whole day in the north of Norway without meeting anybody. That's sort of the <laughs> down part of inviting yourself to come visit somebody. But it's a nice part of the country, and I had a good day out. But... Uh, yeah, we still miss some parts. Now what do we do? We keep visiting. All reporting sites got personal visits. We sent, sent results back to reporting cities because we believe that telling them what they do is good. Uh, we invited registration personnel, all the people sitting in all the different hospitals in Norway, we invited them to come together twice a year to learn from each other, discuss their successes primarily, but also sometimes their challenges. Um, and of course, there is a social part, and I know you're all waiting for that at six o'clock, but um, yeah, the social part is important. Talking together is important. Uh, we made official reports with this picture on it, and we got one big thing. For two years, I worked to get an electronic reporting of cardiac arrest. And in 2014, we got an electronic reporting. And I know you've seen this before, but Eureka has a major impact in a lot of European countries, and Norway is one of them. I was allowed to be part of this. It was really nice. Uh, we tried not to do what these guys are doing, we chose to talk about it as much as possible. I sent mails and I called and I said, hey, guys, we're going to send data to Eureka. And if you send us data, we will tell everybody you sent it to us. And suddenly some of the professors started waking up. Uh, we tried to meet each other, to see each other, to learn from each other. And we tried to listen to what other people were doing. 
how are they doing this in different countries? What can I steal from somebody else? How can I avoid doing the same mistakes that they've done other places? And then I know this is the same picture probably that you've seen before, um, but this is the team and we were allowed to come together and meet at the Utstein Abbey. Tw exactly 25 years after the first Utstein meeting in 1991, we were back. It was one, one week earlier, but still. We were back at the Utstein Abbey and we had a meeting about data collected on the Utstein um, report. So this was really good. And third one from the left, you might recognize him. He's done a brilliant job getting data from Austria. So 2015, it works. Tedious and a lot of work. We now only have two com communities or two hospital areas that are not reporting. The light green ones reported from October. So the Eureka study kick-started quite a lot of registries in local parts of Norway. We had, in, during 2015, we had an official opening of the new registry. Two years after we got the approval, but still we thought, oh, we'll make some media noise around it, and uh, we had an official opening. We have several projects going on improving uh, reporting rates. Some of them are uh, voluntary based, and I have a lot of very good colleagues helping me and some of them are um, from the Ministry of Health. We increased, we doubled the number of employees, so now we are two young girls working in the registry. Uh, and the map of reporting areas was distributed liberally. We sent it to everybody on our mailing list. We even sent it by mail to the Ministry of Health and all the authorities in the hospitals. We thought, maybe um, that would help, because we stopped playing nice. We've been an improved, uh, um, approved national registry since 2013. We have based all our reporting on it being voluntary, that people wanted to join. Um, but now we thought, okay, it is mandatory. Move it, people, you have to give us the data. Doesn't matter if you want to or not, this is mandatory. We still have two regions not reporting, and we started naming them. We started saying, hey, this guy, these people are not sending us the data. We did this also. We published the results, naming everybody. Uh, the column to the left uh, with the, the big blue and light brown columns, that's the number of patients that were included. That should be different because a third of our people live in the capital area. So that's okay. The light brown ones are uh, countries not reporting for the whole year. And then we have the X's. The line is um, the incidence per 100,000 in Norway in 2014. It was 44 per 100,000. And then we marked all the reporting hospitals according to whether they were above the average or below the average or right on average. This is, is quite effectful, saying, A, you, you report 10 cases and none of them survive. And then I don't say anymore. I just leave it there. Or I say, hey, you include 100 cases per 100,000 and your survival rate is... 20% after 30 days. There's a, there's a big difference in how you communicate it. The effect is that nobody dares not to report anymore. I'm a bit unhappy about being that scary, but I'm also very happy that all regions in Norway are now, we have a cooperation. I haven't seen the data yet but we have a cooperation with all the countries, all the, all the regions in Norway. We still have individual follow-up. We still have site visits. I travel a lot. I live in a suitcase. For a, for a while, I'm going to do that, to go there and see them and give their results back and keep motivating them to do this because this is hard work. We're asking ambulance personnel 
to do extra work every time they do CPR. I'm asking about 25 people to put all the data into my registry or our registry. And they usually have to do it on top of their daily duties. They're not paid extra, they don't get extra time. They do this because I'm either very scary or very nice, I don't know, but they do this as part of their job on top of everything else. So why try? Why should Austria try to get a registry? I did a, a net search to try to find publications from Austria on cardiac arrest. My German is not very good, but as far as I could see, there were no publications on national data. Um, but why should you try to do this? I know this has been discussed. Um, my German is, is not too good, so I can't follow all the discussions, but I know you've discussed this during these meetings. Um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Medical calls are mostly mundane, which means it makes no difference from the patient on life and death if you come today or come tomorrow. But sometimes, sometimes it's fatal. If you don't show up in time, the patient dies. Trauma and cardiac arrest are cases like this. Saying a case is mundane doesn't mean the patient will be unhappy if you don't pick him up. But it means he doesn't die. A broken foot is very painful, but you don't die. And clinically, uh, cardiac arrest patients are dead. Death is, luckily for us, a process. It doesn't happen straight away, which means we can stop it and we can turn it. Does it feel like to save a life? What does it feel like when you go out there and you know that what you did today really made a difference? I'd like to quote a good friend and a good colleague of mine, Christian Lexov, the former leader of the Norwegian Resuscitation Council. During the opening ceremony in, on ERC in 2006, he said, saving one life makes it all worthwhile. Saving many lives is an infinite privilege. And we have that infinite privilege as EMS personnel. Do all trauma patients die? I can tell you for sure from Norway, not true. Trauma patients with cardiac arrest survive. Do all old people get bad neurological outcome? Do they all end up like a vegetable in a chair? Not true. More than 90% of the patients surviving 30 days have a good neurological outcome. It's not that much worse than it was when they got their cardiac arrest. Back to 1774, somebody was supposed to watch the time for me. I think I have, when I see you all falling to sleep, I'll stop, but I think I have a couple of minutes left. We go back to 1974, no, 1774, uh, with John Hunter. He was a Scottish surgeon, distinguished man. Uh, this is the same year that electricity was suggested for resuscitation. And he said, we need to document what we see and what we do. We learn continuously, and what is right today may not be right tomorrow. But how would we know? This is 1774, it's a couple of years ago. Do we document what we do? What do you do in Austria? How many cardiac arrests are there? Anybody know? Anybody have a suggestion? Now you're allowed to wake up and wave your hand and answer. Went quite quiet. How many are there in your region? How many did you have last month? Do you remember? Did any of them survive? Did you save a life? Or did you just float along doing what you always do and hoping for the best? What kind of a treatment did your survivors get? Did they get a different treatment from the ones that died? Or were they just unlucky? Is one Austrian EMS region better than another? If you do get a cardiac arrest registry, 
you can actually be the best one. If you're the first region, you are the best because you're the only one doing it, which means you win straight away. There's no reason not to do it. Doctor versus ambulance personnel. Do we need doctors on scene? I'm a nurse. I'm not sure I do need a doctor on scene, especially with cardiac arrest. But do we know? Or do we feel? Nurses feel a lot. What do you do? Well, why don't all of you just go home and start? Start collecting data. See what happens. Put it in a locked drawer, in a locked office. Otherwise, authorities might come and get you. But still, there's no reason you can't do this. Motivate your colleagues to save lives. This is the reason why I keep going. Why I've done this for six years. And why I'm doing this with clammy hands and holding onto the table like I was going to die. <laughs> but sa saving lives makes a difference. It feels good. Give feedback on performance. Tell your colleagues what they're good at. And tell them when they need to improve their work. And ask for feedback on what you do. How can you know that what you do is good if nobody tells you so? Or if it's bad, how can you improve? Don't ever give up. That's my last message. Norway is quite a lot like Austria. We're not sure it's the best place to survive cardiac arrest, but it sure is a good place to live. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingwild, and I'd like to invite Dr. Ian Birdsell for his talk, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards.